The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Just the other day, someone sent me a Wall Street Journal article <clears throat> from three years ago, during the time, of course, of COVID, and the previous election, presidential election cycle, that connects with this gospel a little bit. It's a true story, and a real story, about two families, the Gates family and the Mitchell family, who live next door to each other in suburban Pittsburgh. The two families met some 14 years ago, and they quickly bonded. Each couple has three children, roughly the same ages. Uh, who go to, they walk to school together. They swim in the, Mitch, in the Mitchell's backyard pool. Families uh, share a love for hockey, and the boys play on the same team, uh, and the dads serve as uh, hockey on hockey school board. So you could say that they are very much intertwined. And, in fact, they consider each other family. But during the 2020 presidential election, the Mitchells, lifelong Democrats, planted a Joe Biden sign in the front of their home. The Gates, next door, lifelong Republicans, put up a Donald Trump sign in their front lawn. However, as the Wall Street Journal reported on October 21st, 2020, it was a second sign that made an impact because each family put up another homemade sign on their lawns and it said on each one, we, with a heart, we love them with an arrow pointing to the next house. And in the middle of each heart on the two lawns, with the words, one nation, one nation. There's so much hate, Chris Mitchell says in this article, who came up with the idea, and he said that we want to send a message that people on opposite ends of the political spectrum can actually like each other and be civil. Although they generally don't talk politics, Stuart and Christine Mitchell and Bard and Jill Gates know where each household stands. They don't argue. They don't label each other. They listen to each other's perspectives. They look for common ground and recognize that reasonable and good people can reach different conclusions. We don't see them as Democrats, Bart Gates said. We know that they are good people and likewise, we live, we live next door to them, and they are good people. To love as God loves requires first to see each other, to see each other as God sees us, to look beyond labels and brands, to recognize the goodness every human being possesses simply by being created in the image of God. The only way that we can meaningfully love God is to realize that we are
connected, that we are connected to one another by such love. And obviously, coming to church each week is a very powerful sign of that connection. Three years ago, some folks inquired why the name of Donald J. Trump was in the prayer of the faithful. And more recently, a few inquired why the name of Joseph R. Biden was mentioned in the universal prayer that the, right after, the, uh, after the creed. Well, as St. Paul tells us, we must pray, as he says, we must pray for everyone, especially our leaders, whoever they are, that they make wise and prudent decisions because we are one nation and we are one global community. In these deeply divisive times, especially with war happening in the Holy Land, the words of Jesus is, in the Gospel today are especially challenging. To love with all our heart and soul and mind requires to put aside our mistrust, our anger, whatever it might be, uh, on those who see issues from a different perspective and engage one another in the love and compassion as love as God has engaged us. And we hear at the end of that first reading today, if one cares, if one cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassion. I am suffering with. So in today's gospel, Jesus again is engaged with a dilemma. He's engaged with a dilemma from folks who want him to fall into a trap. And they want Jesus to take the bait that would put himself in a box, in a religious box, or a political box. So if you remember from last weekend, we heard the story about, you know, is it, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, sure, give Caesar what is Caesar's due, but give to God what belongs to God. Today, Jesus teaches that love is the essence of discipleship. It is the essence of life, as hard as it is. And all that God asks of us can be boiled down to two deceptively simple commandments. That we love God with every part of our being as much as possible, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Interestingly, these commandments that we just heard aren't original to Jesus. Because he takes them from the Jewish law in which he was schooled, in which he was raised, and which he insists elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel he came not to abolish, but to fulfill. But whereas in their original text in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, these commands appear alongside many, many others, here Jesus identifies them as the foundation of law itself. The whole law and all the prophets, the entirety of the scriptures, as Jesus knew it, rest upon love. So the last part of Jesus' answer to this, you might say, very appropriately in time, trick or treat question, echoes the language of the Exodus reading that we hear in the first reading today. Speaking of Israel's widows and orphans, and uh, resident foreigners or aliens, God commands, if you wrong them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear them, for I am compassionate. In this way, biblical law expanded the concept of neighbor to include the dispossessed and the powerless and everyone in between. They were deserving of the same protection and benefits. So that means that explicit in this first reading today and implicit in the gospel is the warning that the powerless find their defender in God himself, in God's own person. There's a petition in today's prayer of the faithful, better known as the universal prayer, and it reads, for the people of Israel and Gaza that the care of the poor and the vulnerable, the care of those without sufficient food and water, become the focal point of discussions and the priority for governing bodies. That petition doesn't enter into justification for warfare, but acknowledges that 
power is best expressed by focusing around, as we hear in reading today, the most vulnerable. Leaders in Israel, in Palestine, have the power to focus on the needs of the helpless even as they struggle to achieve their desired outcomes. This is, in fact, God's will, even in a time of war. To love God is to hear the cry of the neighbor, even a distant one, and to respond. And at the same time, to neglect our neighbor is to love God in the head with one's mind, but not with one's life. In every generation, there will be many who can explain rationally why such care is impossible or even a waste of time and resources. But God's commands aren't meant to be products of reason. They are rooted in the experience of real human life. And they bear the characteristics not of the head, but of the heart. So, of course, in our own country, there are lots of divisions, fortunately, not as severe as the Holy Land. But as we gather together from Mass today, let us pray that each of us can and will do our part just to, you might say, display a message to others for the world to see, like those two families in Pittsburgh, that we love them because we are one nation and because we are a global community called by the one God who creates us in love for the purpose of trying the best we can each day to love the neighbor.